Hi guys, welcome to our talk for our paper, Modeling the Social Profiling Hypothesis in an Artificial Light Environment. My name is Imran Khan, and I wrote this paper along with Dr. Matthew Lewis and Dr. Laura Tamimau at the UK lab in the UK. So long-term survival um, in challenging dynamic environments um, is underpinned by behavioral and physiological changes, what we would call adaptation. Individuals who form and maintain uh, close social bonds are seen to live longer, healthier lives, um, although the underlying mechanisms are still not clear. So our research is interested in understanding how the social environment can facilitate adaptation to changing environments uh, in order to develop a, a model of adaptation. So we're, we're motivated to investigate these mechanisms further. So one way in which social bonds are hypothesized to play a role in this long-term survival is through this uh, phenomenon known as social buffering. And social buffering um, hypothesizes that social support provided by bond partners cushions the adverse effects of stressful uh, events or environments. So, you know, cortisol, this hormone of stress, um, has some adaptive functions, but too much, you know, too much cortisol sort of has deleterious effects. So by being able to regulate and adapt this uh, stress response, another hypothesis is that that is what facilitates long-term survival. And this adaptation of behavior and physiology through the social environment um, underpins this concept known as uh, social allostasis, um, which suggests that social creatures adapt their behavior and physiology um, through the interactions with the social environment. And this is what facilitates their long-term survival. So that's the background. What we're going to do is investigate the effects of the social buffering uh, hypothesis through the presence uh, of effective social bond partners and assess the effects on the viability and the social interactions of a small social group um, across a number of different conditions. And look into biology where we see these positive effects on survival. We also sort of hypothesize that these social bonds um, will in improve the viability, so the survival related benefits um, of, the, of the individuals uh, in our society with those social bonds. So each of our agents are endowed with an agent model driven by the homeostatic control of two internal variables called energy and social need. Uh, the goal of the model is to maintain the value of these two variables uh, at its maximum value by correcting any deficits through error correcting behaviours. So it selects a behaviour by accounting for the deficits of, of each of these internal variables, the availability of external resources and combining them uh, to calculate an intensity for each of these motivational states. These motivational states are then mapped onto a, an appropriate behavior that would satisfy those internal variables. So that is the base uh, action selection architecture. Prior to uh, a behavior actually being executed, there's this intermediate step where it accounts for the presence of two hormones. Um, so we've got cortisol, which is our stress hormone, and that stress hormone is released as a function of the combined deficits of these two variables and the lack of availability of external resources. Elevated levels of cortisol increase energy expenditure, which increases the rate at which this is depleted, but also prolonged elevated levels of cortisol results in agents being uh, stressed, which will have an effect on the uh, behaviors. So the social assessment component accounts for the perceived identity of other agents by accounting for the difference in dominance ranks, the presence of a social bond between agents and the bond strength of those agents. So oxytocin's pro-social effects modulates the value of uh, the bond and the, the bond strength. So taking that into account, the social assessment component results in this, this agent value, which can exist between sort of what, minus one and so accounting for the winning behavior, the social assessment component, and sort of the stress system, we have uh, the contextual execution of behavior where touch can take the form of either social positive grooming or social negative aggression. And it can either be sort of approaching food resources or avoiding food resources. The execution of this behavior then releases further hormones depending on those, on which behavior has been executed and also satisfies uh, one of these two variables depending on which behavior has been executed. Uh, behavior execution also has an effect on the recipient agent's uh, hormonal state and the strength of a bond between uh, agents if a bond exists. So the way in which the stress reducing effects of social bonds are accounted for is by using the presence of social bonds to offset the release rate associated with, with a stressful um, environment and what we're calling the stressful environment is sort of a lack of available uh, food and agent resources which would feed into that cortisol rate.
what we do is then set up a society of six agents, and each of these sort of artificial agents have a different dominance rank from sort of A1 to A6 respectively. A higher rank very quickly is associated with increased access to uh, resources. So we have food resources as these yellow uh, yellow spheres here, and other agents as these sort of green donut shapes here. And we also model a, a social bond, and we represent a social bond um, as a you know effectively a socio positive relationship between uh, any agents that are bonded. And we represent this um, using two values in our model. Um, whether or not a bond actually exists, and that's sort of just a Boolean flag of yes or no. Um, and then each of those bonds has a strength, which we call the DSI, or the dyadic strength index associated with it, and that goes from zero to two. So in terms of experimental setup, we investigate uh, three different bond combinations related to uh, those dominance ones that we just talked about, um, across uh, three different world conditions, and these world conditions are related to uh, the availability of food resources. So we have our static environment where the food resources here uh, remain fixed. Um, and then we have a seasonal environment where sort of incrementally we go from four food resources to three, two to one, back up to two, three, four, sort of you know, replicating uh, seasons. And then we have more of an extreme change where we go from four food resources immediately to, to one resource um, you know, every every thousand time steps in our model. Um, we conduct three different experiments. So we have our control condition where we have no social bonds. We then have experiment two where we have these bonds uh, remaining at a fixed uh, strength. So that bond remains a fixed value, its maximum value. And then we have our th third experiment where the bond strength starts off at its maximum value and is impacted by positive and negative social interactions. So that strength can uh, vary over time. Uh, we report our results using two different viability indicators. So we have life length, which denotes you know, how, how long an agent lived for uh, in those environments. And we have physiological well-being, which describes the homogeneity um, of the uh, internal variables, uh, social need and energy. So we also report a couple of other measures. So cortisol and oxytocin levels, which are our, our two hormones. And we are also recording social behavior trends. So our two behaviors being uh, grooming and aggression. So the first thing we're interested in is, is understanding whether or not social bonds actually had any impact on the viability of those agents by looking at our two viability indicators. Um, and these results are aggregated for all bond combinations. Um, and we can see that uh, for all uh, world conditions, for both fixed and variable bond groups, uh, viability was improved uh, compared to control when we're looking at both life length and physiological well-being. Um, it's worth noting that the fixed bond groups actually outperformed the variable bond groups um, across all those uh, different world conditions and those viability indicators. So in terms of our social buffering hypothesis then, uh, we can see that there were improvements to viability um, in those conditions where social bonds uh, were present um, and that certainly for Life length, we see improvements for both bonded and unbonded agents. So, in terms of cortisol, so this is our stress hormone. Uh, you know, we hypothesize that stress would be reduced as a result of the presence of those social bonds and those social buffering effects. And what we can see is for both fixed and variable bonds, we're seeing decreases um, in mean cortisol levels compared to control across all conditions. And we're highlighting here um, a number of cases where cortisol was lower for bonded agents compared to unbonded agents um, but we also know there was a few conditions where we see cortisol levels actually reduce more for agents without social bonds than with social bonds but overall we can see that compared to control um, mean stress cortisol levels um, were lower. When we're comparing the fixed and variable bond groups the cortisol levels between these were not affected uh, by the different bond types. What we actually did see is a significant difference between um, the oxytocin levels um, of these bonded agents across all of those conditions. Um, and if you remember the oxytocin being released as a function of positive social interaction, these values here um, of the mean oxytocin levels give us some insight into some of the social behaviours that were uh, taking place between uh, bonded agents. So in terms of social interactions between bonded agents, and we're just focusing on uh, intra-bond aggression here, 
um, and that is sort of how many aggressive encounters are, are taking place between agents who share that social bond. We can see that there is a pretty big difference between uh, the amount of negative interactions that are taking place between these two bond types. When bonds were fixed, we see pretty low levels of intra-bond aggression, with the exception here. For the variable bond types, what we're seeing is, is much higher rates of intra-bond aggression. Um, and we see that you know that sort of increases a little bit as uh, the world conditions become a little bit more challenging. You know what we can see here is that certainly the intra bond aggressions um, were being affected by the different bond types that we were observing. So in terms of the social buffering hypothesis, where we had expected to see uh, lower rates of intra bond aggression um, as a result of uh, social bonds, what we see is um, you know that is the case when the bond strength is a fixed value, its maximum value. But when that bond strength is more variable, um, we're seeing much higher levels. So we're seeing more context-dependent effects on the rates of, of intra-bond aggression. Uh, so what you can say is that the presence of social bonds, uh, which allows for that social buffering effect to occur, so our experiment two and three, um, resulted in uh, both increased viability and stress reduction um, across all those world and bond conditions. And we saw that for both bonded and unbonded agents. So what we can say is actually those effects um, weren't just limited to agents with social bonds, there were impacts on uh, the wider social group. Um, but what we also saw was that the magnitude of that social buffering effect um, was dependent upon a number of factors, um, including um, the quality of the strength of the affected bond, and that was where we compared the fixed and the variable bond groups, and um, the environmental conditions, um, and that was in terms of food availability, and the interactions of other unbonded individuals. Um, so we discussed these two more um, in our paper, but what we're going to do now is just present a, a quick example as to you know some of the underlying behaviours and mechanisms that, that we believe may have resulted in, in the different rates of aggression between the fixed bond and the variable bond groups. Um, so just to describe this situation here, we have two bonded agents. Uh, we have sort of A4 here is not stressed and A3 who is stressed, so it's red. So here bond strength is fixed at its maximum value. What we have then is oxytocin having a modulatory effect on uh, the bond strength, which has a, a strong social buffering effect as a result of sort of the agent valve resulting in a, in a high value here. Um, and when it comes to behavior execution between these two bonded agents, um, A3, A4 here actually decides to uh, groom with um, its bond partner. As a result of that grooming occurring, uh, we see an increase in oxytocin and a reduction in cortisol um, in its bond partner. Um, and at the same time, because of that grooming has occurred, uh, that sociopositive behavior has taken place, we see further increases in oxytocin, which again will um, further promote this strong bond strength, which will have strong social buffering effects, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing this sort of loop occur. Um, and, and that is why we believe we see these uh, lower rates of intra-bond uh, aggression. So here we see a behavior that we believe is related to the tendon befriend hypothesis, which suggests that in stressful uh, events or during stressful events, that social individuals actually look to perform uh, positive social interactions with each other as a, as a coping mechanism for stress. When bond strength was variable, what we saw then is sort of oxytocin's effects on bond strength was, was still occurring, um, but because the bond strength perhaps wasn't quite as strong, it has uh, less of a social buffering effect. Um, and as a result of sort of that weakened uh, social buffering effect uh, in this situation, then that agent would decide to perform aggression towards its bond partner. As a result of that aggression taking place, we see increases in cortisol in the recipient. That bond strength is further reduced, and there's also no further release of oxytocin, which means then this loop that we saw here um, doesn't have the opportunity to uh, emerge. And as a result of this uh, loop, what we end up seeing is more of a social negative loop where so we see elevated levels of, of aggression throughout the entirety of uh, the experimental runs. To conclude, we see that social bonds provide adaptive survival related advantages um, to agents with social bonds via that social buffering effect, but that the effects are dependent on a number of different social and environmental contexts, as well as sort of the types of effective bonds that we had, we had modeled. So we, we also saw some improvements uh, to the wider society in those conditions where we had social groups, uh, suggesting that there might be more of a widespread impact of those social buffering effects. And finally, that the physiological and behavioural adaptation occurs 
through those interactions with the social environment um, and those affect-based feed-forward loops where positive social behaviours facilitated uh, further positive social behaviours and, and vice versa and that this underpins uh, the mechanisms of social allostasis and we sort of present that as, as a potential mechanism of adaptation for these agents. Uh, and that's everything. Thank you very much for listening.